Okay, this is chapter 10 from um, the Friedland and Ralea book. So this is not your textbook. Um, and basically this first picture here, this is of Headwaters Forest Reserve. And I'll tell you a little story about this forest reserve. But this chapter is entitled Land, Public and Private. Um, okay, Julia Butterfly Hill. This is a young lady who um, decided to take a stand against a really large Pacific lumber company called Maxim. You see, Maxim um, is a was under new management and it used to be um, that it actually used um, sustainable forcing mechanisms and harvesting mechanisms such as the selective cutting uh, but then they to maximize profit they ended up going through and using um, clear cutting um, to make a lot more money um, so Pacific Lumber when it was under Pacific Lumber used to be the leader in environmental stewardship um, they had a hundred year sustainable logging plan but then it was bought out in 1986 and named Maxim so, the result of Maxim's new um, logging and harvesting mechanisms were landslides. As a matter of fact, there were um, a lot of um, issues when there was a huge landslide that affected a lot of homes, a lot of homes were damaged, and there was actually a city sitting up next to the side of their logging area, and basically it was the town of Stafford, California, and in that area there was a lot of homes altered, and the natural environment was altered. Altered. So therefore, um, Earth First organized a tree sit. So this is an organization, and Julia Butterfly Hill remained in this one particular tree. They named it Luna. She was in there for two years. So she didn't even come down to go to the bathroom, and she survived two winters. She survived windstorms, and um, the tree, and she won, actually. So they, just, they agreed that they would not cut down that tree. Um, so a lot of people consider Julia Butterfly Hill a hero, but there's others who might also think of her as someone trespassing on private property. So was she a hero or was she actually in the wrong by, like, do, do you think we have a say in what is done on private land? Ultimately, though, Maxim had to file for bankruptcy protection in January 2007, and its assets were reorganized and transferred to a new company in 2008. Um, so their, their logging practices basically place profit before sustainability and the new company that bought them out says that they're going to actually go back to the more sustainable practices with the trees that are left on its area. Effects of human hand, uh, land use. We have logging. When you have logging, over logging on steep slopes, um, this can increase the opportunity for mudslides to happen, um, especially in your arid regions. When you have arid regions, you get rid of the stable tree roots, um, and then all of a sudden, if you have a heavy rain, um, that's when you get a lot of the mudslides. Deforestation, uh, it leads to and accelerates climate change because you have less of the um, evapotranspiration um, and photosynthesis process occurring. Habitat loss. When you have habitat loss, you have species extinction, um, and basically you're altering the habitat, and it, it, effect, it can adversely affect many species. Even if they don't go extinct per se, it can adversely affect their population, um, and including in this is something called a spotted owl, and they're really, really cute. And then there's also just bad farming. You have soil degradation and water pollution. We talked quite a bit about soil de degradation already. Okay, so Tragedy of the Commons, I've heard this quite a bit before. So basically, um, this book talks about this again, how in 1968, Garrett Hardin described the Tragedy of the Commons, tendency of shared, limited resource to become depleted because people act from self-interest for short-term gain. So basically, remember, this is, um, this is for public land, okay? So if we were to give you an example that had to do with someone's private land, you know that that's not a correct choice. So the solution, though, to the tragedy of the commons is to have private ownership or to use regulations, me mechanisms such as permits and leases. Uh, here's just an example. Um, basically, some of the grazing land, um, we talked about this, and we talked about the act that they put into place to the Taylor Grazing Act to help with the prevention of overgrazing. An externality. Externality is a cost or benefit of a good or service that is not included in the purchase price of a product or service. In environmental science, we are concerned about negative externalities because of the environmental damage for which no one bears the cost. So in other words, when we purchase goods from companies um, not included in the market price are the costs that would be required for the degradation of the environment. So in other words, we're not paying for the extra air pollution that a company uh, puts out, emits when we purchase their product. We're not paying for the extra water pollution from this company that's dumping its waste in the waterways so that we can buy their product 
and, and use it, I'm sure. So that, that cost isn't going into the cost of the goods. Um, an example your book gives you about this is the, the bakery. When you move in next door to a bakery, a positive externality is it, you didn't pay extra rent because you get that yummy smell of bakery next door. Uh, you just kind of got lucky, and that's, that's just an added benefit, an added bonus. On the, on the flip side of that, though, you didn't pay. Um, the company's not paying you any money, that bakery, when they start clinking and clanking their pans at 3 a.m., and now you can't sleep. So that's considered a negative externality. Okay, maximum sustainable yield. This is the maximum amount of a renewable resource that can be harvested without compromising the future availability of that resource. So basically, if we give you an arbitrary number up here, like carrying capacity, let's say it's a population of 6,000. Well, if you get to a population of 6,000, then you're going to have to have people die off. There's going to be war. There's going to be famine, et cetera, et cetera. So you, ideally, you want to be at a place in your population that has the maximum sustainable yield where you can actually reuse resources at a sustainable rate. So you would say, in theory, uh, a population grows at its maximum rate when it's at approximately half. So in theory, for our arbitrary example, we would say that 3,000 is where we want to try to maintain to keep our population um, at 3,000. Um, so let's see, it can be used for animals and trees. Um, problems estimating the maximum sustainable yield, well, you have to obtain an accurate birth rate, death rate, carrying capacity. It can take months or years to determine the effect of harvest levels. These are very, very hard to estimate, actually, because there's a lot of external factors going into play. So you've seen us. We've been trying to, to, um, to get, get an accurate carrying capacity for humans on the earth for years and obviously have not been successful with that. And plus, it keeps moving and changing anyway as technologies um, increase. So it's very hard to even estimate an MS, uh, MSY. Okay, so um, protected areas. This is kind of a cool slide because 11% of the Earth's land is it is protected, and this is neat because you can see which ones are international, national, and both. And just to give you a little better perspective, they say that there's probably about 4.2 billion acres of uh, global land that is actually protected right now. Okay, so public lands um, are basically classified according to their use and how we use them. Uh, so you have your national parks, first of all. Um, there's probably about 3,400 national parks in the whole entire world, and it covers about 400 million hectares, or like 1 billion acres. Um, so they make about 2.7% of the Earth's land area, and you can see here that they're managed for scientific, educational, and recreational use, and sometimes for their beauty or unique landforms. Some of the most famous in the whole world are actually in Africa, and this is like the o Amboseli National Park in Kenya, the Krugel National Park in South Africa, and they exist to protect some of the really cool species like elephants and rhinos and um, lions, and also, of course, for their natural beauty. And then we have managed resource protected areas. These are managed for the sustained use of biological, mineral, and recreational resources. Um, so this one actually allows for the sustained use. See that part right there? So they will let you um, withdraw minerals and some some minerals anyway from this from this site. Um, there's probably about 4,100 sites, and in the U.S., uh, a national forest would be an example of a managed resource protected area. So think uh, managed resource protected areas and national forests. Then we have habitat species management areas actively managed to maintain biological communities. Um, and this is the ones where they use fire prevention and predator control. And this covers more than 740 million acres. Uh, there's a part of Russia that borders Finland has pretty much the highest proportion of protected areas in Europe, and it's 5% of its total area. Then we have strict nature reserves and wilderness areas. These are established to protect species and ecosystems. There are 6,000 of these worldwide. Um, we have protected landscapes and seascapes. These are non-destructive use of natural resources while allowing for tourism and recreation. Um, these are like your orchards, villages, beaches, and other areas. And from here, you get some protected areas. Um, in the Philippines, they have a really cool one because they have some endemic plants there and some marine, cool marine habitats. And then you have national monuments. These are set aside to protect unique sites of special natural or cultural interests. And there's about 20,000 national monuments in the world. Um, and these are established to protect historical landmark. If y'all have ever been to France, there's the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. That's an example of one. Public land in the United States. 
Okay, so here we have the resource conservation ethic. This states that people should maximize the resource use based on the greatest good for everyone. So basically, this is what we're saying that should be done with our public lands. So public lands in the U.S. are rangelands. Um, they are national forests, national parks, national wildlife refuges, and wilderness areas. So um, most of the environmental policies, laws, and management plans are at least trying to be based on this resource ethic. So this means that we have to preserve and manage um, these areas for economic, scientific, recreational, and aesthetic purposes. So to get that, we have our multiple land use lands. A multiple use land, um, it says here, may be used for recreation, for grazing, for timber harvesting, and mineral extraction. Others can protect lands in order to maintain like watersheds and preserve wildlife, fish populations, maintain sites of scenic, scientific, and historical value as well. In the U.S., 42% of land is public. Y'all, this is the highest percentage of public land uh, that, in other words, the public owns in the entire world. Okay, so we have the highest percentage of land that we own as a public. The government owns 25 of the percent of the country. Um, they use it for military purposes, etc. cetera. Uh, most is 55% in the West, 37% is of that's in Alaska. So you can see over here where we use majority of our land. Um, grassland and grazing is the highest percentage. So remember that, grassland and grazing, you see the highest chunk over here of land used in the United States for grasslands and grazing. So for this land that is owned by the public, like I said, a very high percentage of it is owned by the public, it needs to be managed, and this is done by four agencies. So 95% of this land that we all own is managed by four agencies, depending on what the proposed or expected use of that land is going to be. So it's either going to be um, managed by the Bureau of Land Management, the United States Forest Service, the National Park Service, or the Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, BLM lands are usually used for grazing, mining, timber harvesting, and recreation. The United States Forest Service is usually used for lands such as timber harvesting, grazing, and recreation. NPS lands are used for recreation and conservation. And the Fish and Wildlife Service lands are used for wildlife conservation, hunting, and recreation. There is that all again. Hey, would you look at that? Yellowstone National Park. Mm, don't you want to go there this summer? How much fun would that be? Subliminal message. Rangelands. What are rangelands? Rangelands are dry open grasslands. They are used primarily for cattle grazing. Um, that's the most common use of land in the United States. Rangelands are the most common use, use of land in the U.S., okay? They're usually semi-arid and therefore they're particularly susceptible to fires and other environmental disturbances. So if humans overuse them, they're basically going to lose biodiversity. That's why it's important that we do manage these properly. So this is why they enacted the Taylor Grazing Act. Uh, in 1934, this goal was to avoid the, a tragedy of the common situation by switching federal rangelands to permit-based or lease-based system. Some benefits of this, um, of actually using um, land for cattle and other ungulate type of hoofed animals was that these lands were often too dry to farm anyway and then if you um, are using this uh, the ungulates they actually end up kind of you know mowing the grass if you will so this is going to use less fossil fuels than feedlots some disadvantages to this though is that you had poorly managed livestock it damaged stream banks pollute surface waters, and then they were just simply being overgrazed. Uh, so therefore, we were losing a lot of vegetation. So because of the loss of vegetation, that's when they enacted the Taylor Grazing Act. Okay, forests are areas dominated by trees and other woody vegetation. And remember, Pinchot and Roosevelt established the um, U.S. Forest Service to protect timber, uh, but not exactly to protect the habitat. They just wanted to protect the um, use of the timber and the harvesting of the timber. 
And in actuality, about 73% of the forests that are used for commercial timber in the U.S. are privately owned. Um, so if they do, the U.S. National Forest will allow commercial logging companies on their site, but they have to get a royalty for it, which is basically a percentage of the revenues, would have to go back to the U.S. Um, government. Um, timber harvest practices, well, we've already talked about this. Clear cutting removes all or almost all the trees in an area. Um, it's easiest. It's the easiest to do, the easiest harvesting method, in most cases the most economical, um, at the time that is. So long term, it ends up not being sustainable and therefore uh, it won't be economical forever, but at that moment it is. So when a stand or cluster of trees has been clear cut, foresters can replant that and reseed that area. Um, and sometimes an entire area will be replanted at the same time. So the resulting trees will all be the same age, but then because they're exposed to full sunlight, um, they're, they're ideal mostly for the fast growing tree species. Then selective cutting removes single trees or relatively small numbers of trees from a forest, which is better, but when you log logging roads that they have to put in in order to get to the different areas will fragment forests and this increases habitat loss and it will destroy soils. But um, it, basically it's creating small openings in a stand where trees can recede and then young trees can be planted. So the regenerated stand contains trees of different ages. Um, so therefore you actually get some, for that one, since there's already older trees there, you'd probably want to plant something that is uh, shade tolerant for that. Tree plantations, those are large areas typically planted with a single rapidly growing tree species. Um, usually for this one, they're usually easily clear cut for commercial purposes such as pulp and wood and then replanted immediately. But the cycle of planting and harvesting then makes those poor trees never be able to develop into mature, ecologically diverse forests like we know most climax community species forests can become. Here is the example of what the regrowth looks like from clear cutting. You'll see that you have the same uh, age of all the trees there. Here for your um, regrowth for selective cutting, you're going to have a different size trees, different age trees, so you're going to have a lot more shade, so you have to be cognizant of that when you're doing your seed replanting, because basically they're all competing for the same thing. They're all competing for sunlight, nutrients, and water, so if you're going to have a tree that's that's much that much older and taller, it's going to get the sunlight. Solution would be ecologically sustainable forestry, and the goal for this is to maintain all species, plant and animal, in as close to a natural state as possible. This uses animals to pull logs, reduces soil compaction, but unfortunately these folks can't compete economically. So in many ecosystems, fire is a process that's important for nutrient cycling. So uh, when fires move through an ecosystem, they are going to allow nutrients that are in dead biomass to be re-released into the soil. And therefore also when vegetation is killed by the fire, this allows openings for the early successional species. And so it allows succession to, to begin over again. And if, for, to know more about fire management, you should really look over the Smokey the Bear screencast that Ms. T did. Okay, the history and goals of national parks. Well, as y'all know from the beginning of the school year, um, the first park was Yellowstone in 1872. Pay your attention. Okay, and national parks were first established to preserve scenic views and unusual landforms. And um, today, they're actually managed for scientific, educational, aesthetic, and recreational use. And there are 58 national parks since this Yellowstone was uh, founded and established in the United States. Let's see, use the Leopold Report to guide park management. NPS should focus on conservation and protection of wildlife to return parks to their pre-European settler conditions. That's what the Leopold Report says. Wildlife refugees in wilderness areas. Let's see, um, manage for the purpose of protecting wildlife. There are 450 of those nationally and 28 there's 28 waterfowl production areas, and this uses up about 85 million areas, uh, acres, sorry, of publicly owned land. And the national wilderness areas set aside to preserve large tracts of intact ecosystems or landscapes. 60% of that is in um, Alaska. And these basically only allow limited human use and are designated as roadless. 
federal regulations. Okay, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, mandates an environmental assessment of all projects involving federal money or permits. I said that loud for a reason. So this, um, if we were to ask you a question that had to do, um, no honey, if we to ask you a question that had to do with private property, you know that this would not be um, enforced by NEPA. Uh, an environmental impact statement outlines the scope and purpose of the project. So anytime um, the government agency wants to use federal land to build a bridge or create a um, roadway, they have to do an EIS. An environmental mitigation plan outlines how the developer will address concerns raised by the project's impact on the environment. And then Endangered Species Act, law designed to protect species from extinction. So members of the public are entitled to give input into environmental assessment, and the, but the decision makers don't have to respond. I'm sorry, they have to respond, but they don't have to actually um, do anything. However, so they don't have to, you know, they're not obligated to act, but usually when um, public speak out, it does help improve the project's outcome at least. So you do have a voice. Okay, residential land. In the last 50 years, most population growth occurred in two areas, suburban and exurban. Suburban, areas surrounding metropolitan centers with low population densities, and usually they are actually attached to urban areas, go farther and farther out from the, from the inner cities. Exurban is similar to suburban, but are not connected to any central city or densely populated area. So basically, they don't have um, uh, easy access to so since 1950, more than 90% of the population growth in metropolitan areas has occurred in suburbs. And now two out of three people live in a suburb. And here is a graph. This graph clearly shows the shift in population from rural to suburban areas. Um, you can tell the suburban, that's in purple right here, and it has increased, and urban. And rural has tended to decline, but it's, everything's increasing right now because the population's increasing so much. Urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is a creation, creation of urbanized areas that spread into rural areas. So basically, in other words, as people move out of the cities, uh, the metropolitan area basically keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The four main concerns of urban sprawl are automobiles and highway construction. Because with more automobiles, you have, obviously, more pollution. With more highway construction, you lose um, the infiltration percolation of, that you normally get from um, having exposed soil. Um, living costs. People can get more land in a larger house in the suburbs for the same amount of money. Problem with that is that you're now going to have a larger carbon footprint. And guess what? Most of the jobs are still in the cities, so you're going to be spending more time on the road, which creates more pollution from your automobile exhaust. Urban blight. This is the city revenue shrinks as people move to the suburbs, so you're basically losing tax revenue. So therefore, a lot of the streets no longer can afford to be upkept, um, or kept up, sorry. And um, this is when you see a lot of decay, and you see graffiti, and you just see boarded up homes. Um, people are just pretty much taken off. And you end up seeing more government policies. Um, here is pretty much a positive feedback loop because as pe the people um, neighborhood declines, population it starts right here. Population shift to the neighborhood to the suburbs. Tax revenues decline. Therefore, you're going to lose a lot of your bus services. You're going to lose um, roads being repaired, fewer customers. So therefore, businesses leave, and the neighborhood is going to decline and further and further and further. Woo! Okay, some of these government policy, policies I just mentioned are the Highway Trust Fund. This is the federal gasoline tax to pay for construction and maintenance of roads and highways. And this was um, begun by the Highway Revenue Act in 1956, and it's funded by a federal gasoline tax. And this basically just helps, um, helps bring money in, and it allows people to now move farther out, which, like I said, is ending up in a positive feedback loop because more highways means more driving and more gasoline purchases, which lead to more gasoline tax receipts. Zoning is a planning tool to create quieter and safer communities, for example, prohibiting the development of a factory or strip mall in a residential area. This was done, um, started in the 1920s, and it was helped, hoped to separate industry and businesses from the residential neighborhoods to create quieter and safer communities. Um, Multi-use zoning. This allows retail and high-density residential development to coexist in the same area. You're actually starting to see a lot more of this now. If you look and think of uh, Atlantic Station, that's an example. Um, 
of an area where basically you live on above the shops. Um, most zoning in the U.S. though continues to promote automobile dependent development, but this one's pretty cool because it's uh, shops, apartments, houses, and businesses are actually kind of clustered together, and communities are attempting to use this zoning in their mun municipality zones and plans. Uh, if you go to downtown Lawrenceville, you can also see where they've done the same thing. They've created condos right next to the uh, square. Uh, Buford's done this as well. They have uh, shops on the downstairs, and they have little lofts and apartments and condos above that. Um, and all, that's very nice because it helps. You can actually walk and um, shop and walk everywhere in your community. Another awesome example of this is Swanee Park in the Swanee Town Center. Um, there's lofts and condos above the shops and there's a really nice little neighborhood right back, back by there. You should go check it out. Um, something else that they've tried are subsidized mortgages where basically low interest rates are offered to people to purchase a home that would otherwise not be able to do so. So um, this is an attempt to try to get more people in homes become more of homeowners because when you're a homeowner you have um, more stake in that area and basically you you have more um, you have more ownership basically have more passion for it and so you're more likely to keep keep it up um, induced demand basically what this graph is showing you is as we create more and more highway construction where we are allowing people to drive further and further to work and so we're pretty much um, inducing a demand that really wasn't there but now that we have increased a, a supply basically we have an increase in the supply of a good which is the highway has actually caused this demand to grow and it's a positive feedback loop it's basically expanding our suburbs smart growth now this is pretty cool smart growth now this is um, what people are beginning to realize uh, the problems of urban urban sprawl and so they're trying to focus on strategies that are going to encourage the development of sustainable, healthy communities. And the EPA is going to, this is the list that the EPA um, says are the 10 basic principles of smart growth. And again, this is where you kind of start thinking about the communities like um, the one in Swanee, where you're using mixed land. You have some for businesses, you have some for residential, a range of housing opportunity. This is where um, you don't have all the million dollar homes in one neck of the woods, and then you have all these you know, smaller homes in another. You actually kind of mix it up a little bit. You create diverse land opportunities. It's a range of ho housing opportunities and choices. Um, basically, it's for all income levels, in other words. Um, create walkable neighborhoods. Basically, walkable neighborhoods are created by mixing land, um, reducing speeds of traffic. They encourage businesses to build stores up on the sidewalk, and therefore the parking lots go behind the building, and that makes it safer for people to walk, and people are going to use their car less. It reduces fossil fuels and tra traffic congestion, and um, more opportunity for civic engagement. And then encouraging community and stakeholder collaboration and development decisions. Um, there's basically stakeholders are the residents. These are the people with an interest in a particular place or issue. So they need to work together to determine how the neighborhoods will appear and be structured. Take advantage of compact building design. Smart growth uses multi-story buildings and parking garages as opposed to sprawling lots. And this is to reduce neighborhoods environmental footprint and protect open space. And this is basically where you have um, the shops and cafes all accessible to pedestrians. Um, foster distinctive, attractive communities with so strong sense of place. Feeling that an area has a distinct and meaningful character is what that means. Preserve open space, farmland, natural beauty in critical environment, um, environmental areas. Provide a variety of transportation choices. Strengthen and direct development toward existing communities, make development decisions predictable, fair, and cost-effective. Mixed land use includes, mul includes multiple use zoning to mix retail, education, recreation, businesses, encourages walking and biking. Y'all seen a lot of these communities popping up all over the place where, look, you have the resident on top and you see the stores on the bottom. Create a range of housing opportunities. Okay, we just went through all these. But notice that you're going to have some different income levels that are going to be able to afford the different homes there. Created, create walkable neighborhoods, created by mixed use zoning, encourage businesses to build on the sidewalk, not parking lot, make pedestrians safe to encourage walking, increases civic engagement. Okay, we already said all these, but I'm going to go through them fast. Residents and business owners should work together with politicians and zoning commissions to decide on how to create the neighborhood. 
Um, Multi-story buildings, parking garages, shops on ground floor with living spaces above. Athens, Athens, downtown Athens has this all over the place too. Super cute. Go dogs. Foster distinctive, attractive communities with a strong sense of place. Sense of place adds to the quality of life for people living there. Basically, it adds character. The, the distinctive, attractive communities, basically what is unique about your area, use that and roll with it. Preserve open space. So parks, habitat, working farmland, etc. Provide a variety of transportation, car sharing, bike lanes, safe roads, light rail, bus service. Woo! Okay, this is historic Auburn Avenue. An infill. Now, this one's super cool. Now, this is also like the Atlantic Station I was telling you about. So, basically, in town vacant lots, areas that have had a lot of warehouse factories go out of business. Um, you see a lot of urban blight. Well, hey, why don't you redo that area and infill and reinvigorate urban neighborhoods? Urban growth boundaries, restrictions on development outside de designated areas. Make development decisions predictable, fair, and cost-effective. Streamlined approval process to allow smart growth and encourage individual plans. Not cookie-cutter houses. Very um, unique. And done.